We continue our sermon series, How Firm a Foundation, where every week we're looking at a biblical truth, a foundational truth of scripture, and attempting to see how we apply that to all of life. This morning we look at the foundational truth of the deity of Jesus. Was Jesus really the Son of God? And to do so, we look at John chapter one. John chapter one is known as the prologue, the prologue of the rest of the gospel of John, where John makes a definitive case for Jesus being both God and man. And if he is God, then he must be Lord. John chapter one, we'll look at select verses together this morning. Verse one reads, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. This word that John is referring to is Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus and Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Look at verse nine. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood nor the will of the flesh nor the will of man, but of God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was written through Moses, grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. The grass withers and the flower fades, but not the word of our Lord. It stands forever. Amen. Individuals, whether they be secular or Christian, for the most part, all agree that Jesus is the most influential figure to ever live. But why? There's some people that don't even believe in Jesus, but they believe in justice. They believe in serving your neighbor. They believe in things like affordable housing. But why? There must be a reason. Why? You see, Jesus, if he was simply a man, there's no explanation for how this mere man could have turned the world upside down. There's no explanation for how a mere man could have influenced society and all of history. For all of the calls of justice and serving one's neighbor and treating one another as you treat yourself or want to be treated, where did all those ideas come from? Just a mere man? Or a mere man who had the power to change the world? It is the distinctive Christian doctrine that Jesus is God and Lord that changed human history forever to the point where we still feel the effects of it today. And if it is true that Jesus is God, it means that Islam and Hinduism and New Age spirituality and secular humanism and postmodernism can't be true. If Jesus is God, it is the one distinctive truth that separates Christianity from all the rest. Because it is the cardinal doctrine that Jesus is God, that no other world religion leader has ever dared to make. It is what makes Christianity different from all the rest. And it is why in the first chapter of John, 
John wants to make a definitive case for the deity of Christ. It is his way of saying, if you don't get chapter one, you won't get the rest of the gospel. If you do not embrace Jesus as both God and Lord, then nothing else I'm about to say matters. The definitive case, John chapter one, for the deity of Jesus Christ. I want us to answer two questions this morning. Who is Jesus and what did this Jesus do? Who is Jesus? John gives us three attributes of Jesus in John chapter one that speak to his deity. The first attribute is this, he is eternal. In verse one and two, we're taken back to Genesis one. In verses one and two, we're taken back to the story of creation. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. We're taken back to the story of creation so that John wants us to understand that just as there is no beginning and end to God, there is no beginning and end to Jesus. He is God, was with God from the beginning. Just as you and I have a beginning and an end, Jesus has no beginning and no end. Contrary to what most people think that Jesus came into existence at Christmas, John wants to make it very clear that John, that Jesus is eternally existent with God the Father. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, no beginning, no end. Jesus is God because Jesus is eternal. The second attribute is this. Not only is Jesus eternal, but in verses four and nine, we are told that he is life and light. He's the source of life and light. Verse four, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Verse nine, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Just as we read in Genesis chapter one, that life and light are together the two are one, that God speaks and light enters into the darkness and brings life to the darkness of creation. Just in the same way Jesus comes and he is the essence of life and light, that he is the epitome, the manifestation of life and light to all that receive him and believe in his name. Jesus doesn't come to be the reflector of life. He doesn't uh, reflector of light. He doesn't come to be the reflector and the, and the teacher or the one who points where you can find life, but he comes as the one who is the essence of light and life. That in him and in him alone can you have light in the midst of darkness and life in the midst of death. And this is the promise of Jesus that he alone brings what we long for and what we desperately need. This is remarkable. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus will declare that I am the light of the world. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus will declare that I have come so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He's making the claim that outside of Jesus, you live in utter darkness and outside of Jesus, there is no life. And I wanna ask you this morning, what are those areas in your life that are dark? and rotting and decaying that need the light and the life that only Jesus can bring. You see, Jesus has not come to simply rescue us and take us to heaven one day, but he has also come right now today to give you what your soul longs for, to give you life to the full now and forevermore. Jesus is eternal. He is the epitome of life and light but he's also glorious. The third attribute that John wants to share with us is found in verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we've seen his glory. Wait a second. 
The Old Testament tells us we can't see the glory of God, that we need to be hidden from the glory of God, but it is Jesus himself that is the manifestation of the glory of God and enables people through faith alone to finally experience the glory of God. The glory of God that is only reserved for God in the Old Testament is now being attributed to Jesus himself. He has glory on display. He is the glorious manifestation of the God that it, we are told was hidden in the Old Testament, now revealed through the person of Jesus Christ, the visible expression of the invisible God. It's why we gather and we worship. We have no business worshiping Jesus and giving him awe and reverence unless he and the Father are one, unless he is the one that reveals the very glory of God. How do we know Jesus is God? He is eternal. He is life and light, and he is absolutely glorious. But John not only shares with us the attributes of Jesus that speak to the deity of Jesus Christ, but he also shares with us what he did, his actions. One of the things that he says Jesus did, taking us back to creation once again, in verse three, not only was Jesus with God in the beginning, but we're told that he created the world. He is responsible for creation. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, wasn't an innocent bystander at creation, simply watching God the Father. But we are told that Jesus, together with the Father, creates the world, verse three. All things were made through him. That means he created it all, Jesus. That means that there is nothing on this earth that wasn't created by Jesus. Think about that. The river that Jesus is baptized into, created by Jesus. The sea that Jesus calms, created by Jesus. And even the hill that Jesus is crucified on, created by Jesus. Do you understand the good news of that reality? It means that there is nothing in the physical creation, there is nothing in your physical existence that is outside of the control of Jesus Christ because he created it all. He created Russia and he created Ukraine and the leaders that rule those nations, responsible for it all. But he not only created the world in a general sense, he created everything in your life so that there would be nothing in your personal, physical existence that is beyond the control and the governance and the authority of Jesus Christ. So that when Jesus enters into your life, he is not removed, but we are told that he is the great high priest that is able to empathize with our weakness because he's created it all. Oh. Not only has he created the world, what else has he done? John tells us that he actually put on flesh. Verse 14, this speaks to the glorious truth of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This word, Jesus Christ, we are told, puts on flesh. Only Christianity has a God that enters into this world, taking the form of a human being. But it's the good news of Christianity because we are told that only one would come that would be able to atone for our sins, that this one would not only have to be fully man, but fully God. It is the incarnation alone that gives us the hope for the atonement of sins, that when Jesus puts on flesh and dwells among us, he becomes like us, yet perfect, yet innocent, making a way for our sin to be atoned for. If Jesus was just a great man, there is no hope for the atonement of sin and no hope of salvation. What does he do? He creates the world. He puts on flesh. But lastly, we're told, he restores us to the Father. Look at verse 18. We are told that no one has seen God but the one who comes from the Father's side, he has made him known to us. One of the great tragedies that we read in scripture comes in Genesis chapter three, 
that we, because of sin, are estranged from the God who has created us. We are separated from the Father because of our sin. And we are told in verse 18 that there is one who has come to do the impossible, to reunite us and reconcile us to the God that we have lost, God our Father. Only Jesus has the power, we are told, because he is divine to do the impossible and reconcile us to the God that we have been separated from. Ernest Hemingway tells a great story of a young boy by the name of Paco living in Madrid. It's kind of like the modern story of the prodigal son. And, and Paco leaves home and he, he, he goes and he wanders through the streets of Madrid and, and his father goes after him, searching for him. And one day, Paco's father posts an advertisement and it reads this, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. Love, Papa. Well, the next day at noon, 800 young men by the name of Paco show up to the Hotel Montana. Why? Longing for a father who fully forgives. Only Jesus, because he is not just a man, but the divine son of God, fully God and fully man alone has the power to reconcile us to the one we long for, a father who fully receives and fully forgives and fully redeems and fully loves. This is the message of Christianity and the message of the good news of the gospel. So if Jesus is God and he is Lord, what does that mean for us this morning? A word of application to the Christian. You might be here this morning and you've been walking with Jesus for years and you say, yes, I believe Jesus is God and I believe that he is Lord, but does your life look like one that has fully surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? You see, if Jesus is God and Lord, it means you can't do business with Jesus on Sunday and have a side business on Monday. I'm gonna do business with God on Sunday and I'll take care of my own affairs on Monday morning. If Jesus is God, it means every square inch of your life is surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It means your marriage and your heart and mind and soul and body and kids and career and your money and your future and all of your ambitions surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you're a teenager here this morning, surrender early your future dreams, your future passions, your future plans to the Lordship of Jesus Christ the aim of your life as a Christian can only be about one thing, not your personal happiness, but the glory of God. If Jesus is Lord and God, he alone becomes central. But a word of application to the non-Christian this morning. Maybe you're here and you've always dismissed Christianity. Maybe you're watching at home and you have not truly reconciled the message of Christianity with your own life. May I plead with you this morning to not say a few things. If you believe that Jesus is one of the most influential men that ever lived, do not say that I just simply can't believe him. You have to do some deep searching in your soul to understand how can this man be the most influential man that ever lived, but I simply can't embrace him as my Lord. If he is who he says he is, then we must reconcile with that truth this morning and not simply dismiss him. As the great C.S. Lewis said, he is either a liar a lunatic, or he is Lord. But you must reconcile with that truth this morning. If you're not a Christian, I plead with you to also not say that I can't become a Christian because I'm not qualified. No, actually that admission makes you qualified 
for entrance into the kingdom of God. It's actually the individual that says, I'm not qualified, that actually qualifies themselves to become a child of God. You see, if you were actually able to qualify to enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus would have had no reason to come. And he certainly would have, and we would have no reason to believe that he is the true son of God. Jesus alone makes a way for those that can't earn it, those that don't deserve it, those that will never qualify to enter the kingdom of God because of our sin. I plead with you that you will find bread nowhere else except through Jesus Christ alone. A few years ago, many of you know that we lost our daughter, Lily. And following the death of our daughter, it naturally brought up a number of questions in our home with our five-year-old and our seven-year-old. And our oldest son, Preston, would naturally ask questions. How do we know for sure that we'll see Lily again? How do we know for sure that Lily's in heaven? Did she do the right things? Did she say the magic words? And time and time again, God used this passage, John chapter 1, to bring across and to make clear the truths of the gospel and the good news that our family needed to hold on to, the truths of who Jesus was as our only hope to know that we will see our little Lily again one day. And it was on January 22nd, 2018, I think we have a picture to show, that my son Preston tracing his hand on the gospel of John chapter one, made the statement and the profession, Preston, seven years old, I believe in God. And you can't see it, but underlined on that passage and in that picture is verse 12. And it was verse 12 that brought everything together for Preston and for our family but to all those who receive him, all those that believed in his name, God gave the right. You didn't earn the right, but God gave the right to become a child of God. Listen to me. Our family has no hope if Jesus is simply a man. Our family has no hope if Jesus is simply a moral exemplar. We have no hope if Jesus was just a great prophet and teacher, and you have no hope as well. Jesus being the Son of God and being the Lord is our only hope and our world's only hope. It is the truth and the good news that Jesus is both God and Lord that gives us hope this morning and understand the gospel that he alone grants us the right to become a child of God. Today for some is a day of surrender. Today for some is the first time where you will come to Jesus as your only hope, more than a man, fully God surrendering your life. Because if it is true that Jesus is who he says he is, may you receive him, may you believe in his name, and may you be given the right from God alone to become a child of God. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, to all those that believe in Jesus and receive him as Lord, you grant the right alone to call us your child. If there is someone here this morning that has never reconciled this truth, maybe their entire lives they have been trying to live as if Jesus was simply a influential figure in history, but not somebody to surrender to. If he is God, and he's Lord. And if he is Lord, may we bow our knee and surrender our lives and receive the life that only he can offer. 
the one who promises to come into our brokenness and our darkness and bring life and light, both now and forevermore. A child of God, not by the will of man, not by any power we possess, but simply through Jesus Christ alone. May there be many this morning that come to the kingdom through Jesus because he is the savior of sinners, the very son of God. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.